in any case, Rose suggested that what I talk to you all about is orthostatic intolerance, which is a reasonably broad topic, and there's a lot that I could talk about. Um, I'll try and keep it relevant, but give a little bit of an overview about, about orthostatic intolerance. To start with, I thought I'd put it into a little bit of context about what I do. So as I said, I'm a consultant physician at Christchurch Public Hospital. That, I'm going to talk through different types of autonomic difficulties and some of the approaches that you might take to diagnosing and managing these problems. So I'm trained in adult internal medicine and what that means is I spend most of my time on the general medical wards dealing with a whole range of problems, some of which are autonomic in particular faints or collapses or dizzy episodes, but also a huge range of other things from infectious diseases through to heart problems, etc. But I got a real interest in autonomic problems and so for about the last 12 years I've been doing outpatient clinics two half days a week um, in what's called the Funny Turns Clinic, which I know is quite a silly name, but it sort of covers a spectrum of autonomic problems. It's not a lot of time to be doing that in terms of how common these conditions are. And realistically, I see um, about six new patients a week and also do some follow-ups on people that I'm have, have got ongoing input from. And what that really means is that most of the autonomic problems are managed by people's own GPs, but I um, will see people where it's either very unclear what's going on and some more testing is needed, or the patient and their GP have been working on something and, you know, really not making a lot of progress. I do a bunch of other stuff as well that I, I won't go into in the interest of time. And so in terms of the reason that this clinic is called the Funny Turns Clinic is it used to be called the syncope clinic and syncope is the medical word for fainting. But a lot of people would say, well, I'm not fainting. And also who even knows what syncope is? And so many, many years ago, they changed the name to Funny Turns, recognizing that not everyone that we see is actually fainting or losing consciousness or collapsing. And it sort of covers many different types of episodes that people might have. In terms of the most common things that we see here, still uh, fainting is the commonest, reasonably closely followed by low blood pressures when people stand up. And then we come into orthostatic intolerance of which postural tachycardia syndrome that I'll talk quite a bit about today is um, increasingly common. And then a bunch of other things, including um, Heart, dis heart problems, seizures, et cetera. So it's a pretty broad, broad range that we see. One of the things that um, I can offer in this clinic that is a bit different, and there's actually only three of us in the country that are doing this, is something called tilt testing. And it looks worse than it is. It looks a bit like a medieval torture device, but it's a really good way to get a look at two things, really. One is the underlying um, function of the autonomic nervous system that controls things like blood pressure and heart rate, both when we're resting and when we become upright. So it looks at how well your body is controlling all of that. And secondly, it sort of matches that up with any symptoms that people might be getting. And so it was developed um, by this guy back in the 1980s, I think. Um, this is a um, scientist from the Netherlands, and it's quite um, unique because it's a continuous blood pressure and heart rate monitor. So you can see he's got this little cuff on his finger, and what it does is it compresses and relaxes, and it uses infrared light to measure the changes in flow across the tiny little arteries in your finger, and it gives um, these things called arterial pressure waveforms. It gives a really good look at blood pressure. And the beauty of being able to do it continuously is you're not going to miss anything. So what we know is that sometimes if people stand up when you do a normal arm um, blood pressure cuff, you might miss some quite dramatic changes that occur quickly. Um, and basically that bed that you saw on the previous um, page is what the person is on. They get hooked up to this little monitor, the bed will bring them slowly to almost upright with this continuous monitoring on. And then they'll be monitored for a period of about 
well, usually at least 10 minutes unless they're feeling unwell. Um, some people need a longer period of time and some people I might go on and do some um, more detailed recordings of how well your body is controlling that blood pressure and heart rate response with a few different maneuvers. So I can get a really good look at how that nervous system is working. And when I talk a little bit about this thing called the autonomic nervous system that I get so excited about, we sort of think of it as the control center of the body. So it deals with the inner world. It deals with all those things that your body normally does without you having to think about. Things like your heart beats, your blood pressure adjusts itself, you breathe, you have digestion and you know your kidneys do their thing. And it's probably better described as the auto automatic nervous system because it's the things that you do without thinking, your body just normally does for you as opposed to the voluntary system, which might be, I'm gonna use these muscles walk across the room or to pick up the spoon or whatever. This is a really complex diagram, but I thought I would leave it in there just because I think, first off, many of you, I know you're, you're a really educated group, you may well have come across these sorts of diagrams. And it just gives a little bit of an idea because when we think about the autonomic nervous system, there are two main parts to it and they work together um, in synergy to control all your underlying body functions. But you can divide it up a little bit into the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and basically what both of these systems do is send signals from the brain out through the spinal cord and nerves to multiple different parts of the body. You can see almost every organ. And they also receive signals back from the body that go to the brain. So it's constantly adjusting your internal workings. And when we think about what those two parts do, they roughly get divided a little bit. So we think of the parasympathetic nervous system as sort of doing rest and digest. A lot of that comes through this cranial nerve 10 called the vagus nerve. That does a lot of stuff of regulating your heartbeat, getting all your digestive processes working. The sympathetic nervous system is what we think of as fight or flight. And the way I often describe that is, you know, you're being chased by a tiger or something. What has to happen is your heart rate needs to go up. Your blood pressure will go up a little bit. Your digestion gets switched off. You've got to be able to run. And so what, when people talk about problems with autonomic, the autonomic nervous system, there are various different things that can go wrong. But when people are talking about dysautonomias, it's a problem in those systems that I've talked about earlier. And usually what they're referring to is um, a change in the way it functions when the system is quite intact. So we're not really talking about things like um, a stroke that might affect that part of the brain or a spinal cord injury. When we're talking about dysautonomias, we tend to be thinking about the system is not working properly. And so that might cause problems with blood pressure regulation or digestion, that sort of thing. And one of the reasons I put this quote in from Dr. Goldstein, who is really famous in this area, is that the word functional has different meanings in different settings. And I thought it was important to mention that because I certainly know that when I've been talking to doctors before and I've talked about functional, and sometimes when I've been talking to patients, people mean different things. And in some areas, the word functional can be used to imply that it's maybe not a physical problem or is it a psychological problem? And I wanna clarify that's not at all what I mean. What I'm meaning is that the system is not working properly. In the same way that you might describe migraine as a problem with the way the brain is functioning, migraine is clearly a thing, it's clearly a diagnosis, but if you examine people's brains by scans or things, you won't really find anything that has gone wrong with you know, the structure of the brain if that makes some sense. And so that's, I know, all background, and I'm sorry it was a bit wordy. I'm going to get on now to what Rose really asked me to talk about, which is this thing called orthostatic intolerance. And what that really means is that people have problems when they become upright, when they change posture from lying to sitting or sitting to standing. 
And while the commonest things that you hear about are dizziness or palpitations, so your heart pounding or racing, there can be a whole host of other symptoms that people might really identify only happen when they become upright. So for some people, it may be predominantly breathlessness or discomfort in their chest, you know, blurring of their vision or worsening fatigue. So there are a range of symptoms that put together we would call orthostatic intolerance. And people might have just one or they may have the whole lot. And so if you hear the term orthostatic intolerance or postural intolerance, it means the same thing. They're interchangeable. And there are a range of different things that can cause symptoms when people become upright. And I guess the sort of classical orthostatic syndrome that we would probably know more about is postural tachycardia syndrome. And that's when someone's heart rate will go up much more than it should when they become upright. Um, the other really common one is someone's blood pressure goes very low when they stand up. But we're sort of recognizing that there are others. And the one that many of you, um, if not most of you will be familiar with, is that you may have all of the symptoms when you become upright, but there's no overt change in your blood pressure or heart rate, but you've clearly got the symptoms. Um, I won't talk too much about the other two, not so relevant today, but just to say that some people can have intermittent problems, like if they're prone to fainting if they stand for too long. But in general, when I'm talking about orthostatic intolerance, I'm meaning people who have symptoms, you know, frequently, pretty much every day. So I'm going to talk a little bit about POTS, that's postural tachycardia syndrome, mainly because it's quite a good model of orthostatic intolerance that we've got a lot of research knowledge about. And a lot of what we know about it can be applied to orthostatic intolerance and MECFS. Um, also because there's quite often a bit of confusion about how to diagnose it or who to diagnose it in to talk about it. Um, so for POTS, the criteria for diagnosing it is first off, you've got to have, you know, regular postural symptoms that I talked about. And as well as that, you have to have this increase in heart rate. And for most of us, if you stand up, your heart rate will go up a little bit because that's how your body adjusts to gravity and the fact that when you stand up, your blood wants to drop downwards. So your body has to increase your heart rate a little bit. But people with POTS will have a big increase in heart rate. And by that, I mean more than 30. So if your resting heart rate is, say, 60, your heart rate will be up at more than 90 for all the time that you're upright. So basically, you will become upright, your heart rate will go up, and it will stay up. And often it goes really high. You know, it's often more than 120. But I saw someone just last week whose heart rate when they were upright was over 150 the whole time they were up. And you can imagine how awful she felt. I will make a note that in younger people, when their bodies are not finished developing, so this is people under the age of 20, their heart rates naturally often go up 20 or 30 points. So to diagnose POTS in them, it should be an increase of more than 40. And I wanted to make the point that that must happen without your blood pressure dropping. Because what we know is that if the main problem is that your blood pressure drops every time that you stand up, your heart rate will go up to try and compensate for that. So POTS is a situation where the primary thing that happens is the heart rate goes up, even though the blood pressure is doing exactly what it should. And in fact, for some people with POTS, the blood pressure actually goes up. And this is just a little picture of what it looks like um, if you were to do a tilt test. So at the bottom here, you can see the time of tilting. The middle line is the blood pressure, which essentially stays the same. But on the top line, you can see the heart rate is going along. When they become upright, the heart rate goes up, stays up the whole time. The bed gets lowered and the heart rate goes back to normal. And it stays up that whole time. And so if people, a lot of people might have a real transient increase in heart rate when they go upright, um, and then it settles back down to normal. That's not POTS, even if it's quite fast. Some people 
For example, if you make someone hyperventilate while they're upright, their heart rate will go up, but it will fluctuate. That thing of the heart rate going up and staying up, that's what POTS looks like. And obviously, well, it's easy for me to do a tilt test on anyone that I suspected. I can't tilt everyone you know, in the greater Christchurch region who's got postural symptoms. And so a lot of this is um, being done by GPs. And one tool that's quite useful for them is something called a NASA lean test. And people have called it sort of a, a um, you know, it's not a very nice term, poor man's tilt is what they call it. And basically you'll get someone standing with their feet about 20 centimeters out from a wall and leaning back against the wall. So they're a little bit supported. They're not just standing upright. And that also unloads the muscles in the legs. So it's sort of, you know, doing a little bit of a kind of semi-tilt. You can put a pulse oximeter on them. You know, the little thing that you put on someone's finger to do continuous heart rate monitoring. And you can do a series of normal arm measurements to make sure the blood pressure is not going low. And that is just about as good as a tilt. Um, in terms of diagnosing POTS, when I first started doing this, it was really underdiagnosed because people just weren't aware of it. And because people would always be focusing on, well, what's the blood pressure doing? Nowadays, people are, look, are better at looking at the heart rates and recognizing this problem. But even now, you still get people who have this misdiagnosed as an anxiety disorder because people often feel awful. And anyone who's experienced this knows that your heart's racing, you feel shaky, you feel dizzy and unwell. And if someone's just measuring the blood pressure and saying, oh, no, you're fine. So, you know, you must be anxious. And it, that's been a really hard thing for anyone with orthostatic intolerance to be dealing with. Um, and sometimes people with this condition do also faint. So it would get put down as a variant of fainting. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, some people don't feel dizzy or their heart doesn't race. They might just feel, you know, breathless or um, have discomfort in the chest when they become upright. Now that people are understanding more about this, underdiagnosis is less of a problem. And what I'm sort of seeing now is overdiagnosis in that um, a lot of the time I can see anyone who stands up and gets lightheaded for any reason may have a diagnosis of POTS, but and that can be really helpful in terms of looking at it and measuring the problem and, and managing it. But my worry is you might miss what the actual problem is. And you might also miss labeling. You might also label someone with a medical problem that is, you know, quite a frightening thing to have and that, that they don't have. So it's just a, probably a matter of being a little cautious in how, um, and how to do this. And so I mentioned sort of being careful and younger people who often have um, a heart rate that goes up when they stand anyway. And a lot of young people when they're growing really fast, um, in particular people who get very tall very quickly, often feel briefly lightheaded when they stand up and their vision may close in briefly. And they tend to grow out of that. Um, and it doesn't tend to be so limiting as people with POTS whose symptoms are really disruptive in day-to-day -day life. Whereas young people growing fast may have a period of feeling briefly lightheaded, but it's often kind of, you know, I jump out of bed in the morning, I feel a bit woozy, but then I carry on with my day, as opposed to people with POTS who find they, there's so many things they can't do. I'm a bit cautious in um, making a diagnosis of POTS if people are on certain medications that can make your heart race. And in particular, I'm thinking of things like um, tricyclic medications that many people, particularly with chronic pain, may be on that can cause a postural tachycardia, um, but also um, some antispasmodic medications, some bladder medications, and also quite a lot of pain medications like gabapentin, codeine, tramadol. So I won't rule it out and say, oh, you're not going to have POTS, it's all the medications, but I'll just be a bit cautious and not labeling someone with it if I'm concerned that the medicines might be contributing to how they feel. But let's try again. So Yes, deconditioning. It's really thorny because we know that if people are like astronauts in anti-gravity for several weeks or if people are bed bound for any reason, that does mess with your autonomic nervous system and decondition it. And it can certainly contribute. 
it's usually not the whole cause, in my opinion, and I'm sure that's what you've probably all encountered as well. So while it's important to think about it, and if, for example, I had somebody who had, you know, had a critical illness, been unwell for several weeks, and then developed postural symptoms purely in the context of that, I might say to them, look, there is a chance that a lot of this might be deconditioning and you know, some optimism that it will gradually improve and go away. But if it's a situation of someone who's had gradually progressive orthostatic intolerance without any obvious trigger, and then that has caused them to do less, um, then sure, you don't want them to decondition completely that will contribute to it, but it's not going to be the problem on its own. So it can be a tricky thing to work out. Um, I've made a mention in there also of eating disorders because we know that if people lose a lot of weight in a short period of time or if they um, have a really restrictive diet, very low calorie diet, then people do start to get postural dizziness, orthostatic intolerance. And again, there's no reason why people can't have both weight loss and POTS, but I guess my cautions in those situations is what I don't want to do is say, okay, you've got POTS, let's work on that, and not look for any underlying things that we could maybe work on and help that person with. So sometimes people can have more than one thing, and I guess I just don't want to see people um, jumping straight to the POTS or the orthostatic intolerance without really looking at all the other things that might be going on for that patient. And I think that's one thing that I often find is there's often more than one thing contributing. So I might say, yep, you've definitely got orthostatic intolerance. And it, it may be that you're a bit iron deficient and maybe the gabapentin you're taking are contributing. I don't think they're causing it, but there's other things we could work on to, to help improve your symptoms. So thinking a little bit about who gets POTS and the biggest studies come out of America and it's much more common than people think. So one, one to two people per thousand and more people than that have orthostatic intolerance as a whole. And it's interesting that most people are women and it commonly comes on between the age of about 15 and 45. And in particular in people under 20, there's a viral trigger and about 50%. And autoimmune conditions like celiac disease are also quite common, particularly in the pediatric age group. But a lot of people also have a family history. And the reason I put that little picture in there with the cat is partly because I thought it was cute. And also because it's all very well for me to talk about what this is and who might get it. But the thing everyone wants to know about POTS and, and all forms of orthostatic intolerance is what exactly what exactly is it? What causes it? Why do people get this? And we don't know for sure yet. And I think I can comfortably say the same thing for orthostatic intolerance and MECFS. We don't really know. And I think the problem is that POTS is a syndrome. It's a mixed bag of things that, that, that looks the same in the end. It culminates in you feel dizzy when you stand up. But in the same way that anemia is a syndrome of not of having a low blood count, that could be caused by you know excessive bleeding, or your body can't make enough blood because you know your bone marrow is not working, or you're missing iron, or maybe your body's destroying the blood that you make. In that same way, I think that orthostatic intolerance is caused by many things, and so I've I've put there some of the things that people think about which includes damage to the nerves, particularly the sympathetic nerves that um, you know should constrict and tighten up when you stand to stop all the blood dropping downwards. Some people do have evidence of nerve damage. There's a thought that people with POTS and orthostatic intolerance might not regulate their blood volumes very well, no matter how much fluid they drink, they seem to be running a bit dry. And that's true for some people. There are definitely some genetic syndromes and there are some families where they've found some mutations in certain um, transporters of adrenaline-like hormones. I think there's more and more emerging evidence that this is an immune-mediated problem. I've slightly moved my computer just in case that makes a difference. So 
I think I was sort of saying that that basically it really does seem that many people with um, with orthostatic intolerance have got um, more autoimmune problems. So people are more likely to have celiac disease, um, autoimmune thyroid disease, and, and you know, a few other autoimmune type problems. There's been quite a lot of discussion in recent years about connective tissue disorders, in particular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, with the thought, which does, you know, link with orthostatic intolerance and a thought that many people may have sort of floppy connective tissues so that when you stand up, the blood drops down to your feet because the connective tissues and blood vessels aren't tightening up to keep blood up here as they should. It's been surprisingly hard to prove that in studies, and it seems so logical that that may be a good explanation, but we just haven't been able to prove it yet. Um, and I guess I just wanted to, this again is from David Goldstein, and I just wanted to make the point here that many people with POTS or other forms of orthostatic intolerance have got symptoms across many other bodily systems. So it may well be a marker for dysfunction in other parts of the body, such as people often have irritable bowel type symptoms, um, chronic pain, particularly fibromyalgia, migraine, headaches, um, fatigue, heat intolerance, and sleep difficulties. And what we don't really know is whether this means autonomic function across the, the board is not working, or whether these conditions sort of co-associate in some central processing part of the brain. We really don't know yet. Because I'm a bit short on time, I'm only going to just briefly mention the postural hypotension, the low blood pressures that I mentioned earlier. And it is really important to check out for that in people who are getting dizzy when they stand up, because that's something that is managed quite differently. And the commonest cause of postural hypotension that I see is medications, in particular blood pressure medications, but also uh, many pain medications, diuretics, etc. cetera. Um, things like dehydration, weight loss, and then certain conditions like that cause nerve damage, like diabetes and Parkinson's-like conditions. So it's really important that people are checked out for that because the approach to managing that is different. And so to talk a little bit about orthostatic intolerance and MECFS, and I'm sure, you know, as many people with chronic conditions, you folk will be well more informed about this than I am. But I guess what I wanted to sort of acknowledge is how common that it is. You know, estimated 75 to 90% of people have orthostatic symptoms. And so much so that it's now part of the diagnostic criteria. And classically, that is orthostatic intolerance without changes in heart rate and blood pressure. And there has been so much debate as to why this happens. And in the last couple of years, Van Kampen and her team have done a lot of looking into this. And what they have found is that if you do ultrasounds, and actually, this is a research tool, I don't, I don't have it in my lab, but you can actually measure blood flow um, to the brain through the key arteries. Um, and you can do that while you're tilting someone. And what their team found was that that 90% of people with MECFS have got reduced blood flow to the brain when they're upright. And it drops by about 24%, so about a quarter, compared to a normal slight drop in, you know, sort of 7% of people without those symptoms. And it does seem to link with the symptoms that people are getting. So you will see the drop in blood flow and it will go along with the person getting symptoms. So we know that it's real. And it also tends to go along with worsening sort of cognitive function, you know, task-based memory, concentration, processing, things that people are really aware of if they've got MECFS. What we don't really know is why that happens. There's been quite a lot of discussion about carbon dioxide. And so that relates 
in some ways to breathing for some people. We know that when we breathe in, we breathe in the air that's got a mix of oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and we breathe out, we extract some oxygen, we breathe out some carbon dioxide. If people are hyperventilating, if they're over breathing or breathing in a dysfunctional manner, and, and there's a wide range of reasons that can happen, I recently saw someone who had some rib fractures and that got their breathing out of kilter. If you are hyperventilating um, chronically, that does lower your carbon dioxide and that causes uh, vasoconstriction, so tightening of the blood flow and less blood flow to the brain. So for some people, that might be the case, but also some of the research is suggesting that you get this reduction in blood flow, you know, independently of what the breathing patterns are doing. So I don't think we've got all the answers for this yet, but it's exciting to know that people are looking into it because hopefully that will lead on to getting a better understanding and a better range of options. Um, I briefly mentioned hypermobility um, as something that commonly goes along with postural symptoms. And I, I think in the interest of time, I won't go into that too much more. We can always talk more about it at the end if need be. I'm going to mention psychiatric and psychological issues in orthostatic intolerance really um, because I think it's important to address it. Two reasons really. One is that many people who have got postural symptoms have been told that it's all in their head or that it's psychological and that's incredibly distressing to people who are getting a lot of symptoms. And so people have gone and looked at this specifically in the POTS population, but it probably extrapolates to all people with OI. Um, and what they find is that there probably isn't any increased um, what they call psychopathology, but that means sort of mental illness, anxiety, depression, et cetera. This is not a group of people who are more psychologically unwell and that's why they're getting symptoms. Um, and so, that's really going against that suggestion that, that orthostatic intolerance is a psychiatric or psychological condition. Now, of course, if you have someone with chronic illness that's impacting on their day-to-day -day life, that leads on to worsening mental health. And that's the other reason that I think it's important to always think about mental health, in particular anxiety and depression or health-related anxiety because those are things that can often happen as a result of people's symptoms, but it will make the symptoms worse in the same way that it will make any symptom worse. If you've got someone who's very limited day to day with arthritis and then they become depressed because of that arthritis, it's going to make the pain worse. That's unfortunately how the body works. So I think it is important to think about it, but to reassure that these are not psychiatric conditions that um, I'm talking about. There's a little bit of work though on adverse childhood events because there is a thought that if people come across a, a lot of adverse events in their childhood that can sort of rewire the autonomic nervous system so they get this what you might loosely call a hyperadrenergic state. Their bodies are prone to squeezing out a lot more adrenaline because they might have lived a lot of their life in that flight or fight state and that can, can rewire their nervous system. And the other thing I was going to mention, and again, it's not clear what's chicken and what's egg, but a lot of people with chronic conditions of um, body function, so things like POTS, things like irritable bowel or fibromyalgia, they seem to have something wrong in their pain receptors um, and the way their bodies sense and respond to pain. Um, and we don't really know whether their body has become more sensitized to pain because they've had so much of it or whether they develop chronic pain because their body's signaling is wrong. There's so much we don't understand yet. I know this is all a bit vague. I guess I'm trying to sort of um, highlight that there's a lot of gray areas and we don't know what came first. I'm going to very briefly mention long COVID because I think it's really important in that we may, it may really improve our understanding of MACFS and of orthostatic intolerance. Because what we have is a whole bunch of people with symptoms that we know came on from a particular trigger, so we know when they happened and we're gonna be able to study them. 
Long COVID probably falls into two main groups though. There's one group where you have got heart or lung damage. And that is why the person is having longer term problems with breathlessness, palpitations, chest pains, that sort of thing. And there are tests that we can do to assess for that. And the other group looks like an immune mediated response and it looks very, very similar to MECFS. So I think we're gonna get a lot more understanding. And it seems to occur in a quite similar sort of population to MECFS. And orthostatic intolerance is very common and probably between a, a fifth and a quarter of people with long COVID will actually meet the criteria for POTS. But most of them will have orthostatic intolerance and a normal tilt, very similar to people with MECFS. I'm mindful of time. I'm not going to talk too much about testing Apart from to say that when I see someone with orthostatic intolerance, I want to be careful that I've ruled out easily treatable conditions that could be either causing or contributing, and in particular, um, um, vitamin deficiencies, uh, hormonal metabolic problems. Um, I mentioned um, echocardiograms and heart ultrasounds because naturally people who are experiencing a lot of these symptoms are really concerned about their hearts and I have to say in all the sort of 12 13 years I've been doing this I've done quite a lot of heart ultrasounds and I've never yet found someone where they have a heart condition that's causing this however I will do the scan if there are um, pointers when I'm seeing someone, in particular if there's um, a family history of you know sudden cardiac death or particular heart conditions, or if I hear a heart murmur, or if their baseline um, ECG, which is where they put the stickers on your chest to look at your heart electrics, if any of those things are abnormal, that's when I'll look at some more detailed heart testing. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about management of orthostatic intolerance because that's where hopefully some of you may get a few pointers, although I'm aware you may well have gone through all of this already. And to mention that most of the evidence around it is from the POTS group because this is a large group with a lot of study going on. In my mind, many, but not all of the approaches are applicable. And if I'm meeting someone and they don't have POTS, but they do have orthostatic intolerance. What I'll say to them is, you know, the treatment is broadly similar, except there are some medications that will be off the table. Most of the time, though, with the initial approach to managing orthostatic intolerance, um, you're going to be looking at non-medication measures. And the, the evidence behind that is that the non-medication measures are just as good, if not better, in terms of long-term symptom management, prognosis, recovery, they're just as good as, if not better, than medications. So I tend to start with all the non-medication options, do a really good go of those, and then there will be some people who need medications. And although some of the, the medications have not got any proof in the MECFS group, occasionally, depending on someone's individual circumstances, I might try one. So I've listed the, uh, the key strategies and I've put brackets around the ones that are less likely to be relevant in MECFS and I'll go through these. And when I talk about exercise, I start with that first because in the post POTS research, that is the thing that makes the biggest difference. And the problem is for people with MECFS, that old chestnut, the graduated exercise program, it, as you'll all be aware, can actually be a damaging thing um, and it's not recommended. So it is quite different. So if someone has POTS, we'll be talking about a specific autonomic training program of exercise. For someone with MECFS, I will not be going there. But what I will think about is ensuring that deconditioning doesn't worsen their situation and it's going to be very simple because you don't want to be crashing and burning. And there is a really good website called Dysautonomia International that has some very simple floor-based exercises looking at reconditioning the muscles in your lower body that help to return blood from your extremities, from your lower body, 
back up to your brain and just keeping a little bit of tone in those lower body muscles can actually make a difference so that when you become upright, you know, there's just a little bit more action there to keep the blood up here when you stand. Um, the rest of it, I'm not going to talk about in the MECFS group because it's not relevant. Um, if people are wanting to do some very gentle reconditioning or exercise, they will have to do it extremely slowly. And I generally recommend that they start doing it from what I would call recumbent. So, you know, people may want to do a kind of a one of those resting exercise or they may think about some gentle swimming, but I would never say you've got to get up and go for a walk or a run. Um, so the other key strategy is getting your fluid status really good, getting your central blood volumes really well topped up so that when you are upright, even if blood is shifting down, you've got more to get to your brain. And so when we think about this, the ways to get your fluid in and retain it is it's quite boring, it's quite nano like, but it does make a bit of a difference. And so that kind of, you know, everyone should have eight cups of water a day. For most people, that's not really required. It was a bit of a marketing gimmick from the water companies. But we know for people with orthostatic intolerance, they don't seem to hold on to their fluid so well. So they want to ideally be aiming for three liters of fluid a day if they can. And then to hold on to that fluid, a high salt diet and I know that that sounds really weird to a lot of people because you know we've all sort of been brought up on you've got to cut down on your salt because it will increase your blood pressure and harden your arteries etc and that is true for people who have high blood pressure what we know is that people with orthostatic intolerance they a don't hold on to their fluid and b often have blood pressures at that low end of normal and so at that point in time they can and should eat a stack of salt it will bring your blood pressure up a little bit, but the long-term studies are not suggesting that it goes you know, high and damages your arteries. Um, and it will help you to hold on to your blood volume. And it can often make a huge difference to how people feel. And people are often a bit skeptical, but often people will say, I wasn't sure it was doing all that much, but when I stopped doing it, I felt a whole lot worse. And so the, the sort of rule of thumb is, that you know, the average New Zealand diet has um, about you know three and a half grams, which is about a teaspoon and a half of salt per day. I will generally tell people they want to be um, getting in as much salt as they can, and if they're not sure how much to add, they can measure out an extra teaspoon of salt in the morning and try and get through that during the day. Um, and that gives them an idea that as, as opposed to just adding salt to their fluid or eating a lot of salted nuts or adding soy sauce or having packet soups, you know, you can, there's a lot of info on that dysautonomia website about how to get more salt in, but often people find it helpful to measure it out. Some people hate salt. And so I've had people that take salt tablets or that will use electrolyte drinks, although those have often got a lot of sugar and sugar can cause a bit of a crash. Um, or I get people who fill gel capsules from the pharmacy, but those also are not cheap. So the simplest thing, if you can, is just to get a stack of salt in there. And sometimes I will actually measure a 24-hour urinary salt level on someone to know if the amount that they're getting in is enough for their body. So there's ways and means to, to monitor what's going in and to measure, is that enough for your body? Um, I wanted to briefly mention mechanical measures because there are things that you can do again to help keep the blood up here where you want it going to your brain and so what I haven't got there and I may have had it on another slide which I think is quite relevant for people who um, are um, having to rest a lot of the day is just a little bit of gentle autonomic retraining if possible to rest with your head up a little bit um, rather than lying flat and that does help to retrain things a little bit and then at night it can help if you tilt your bed slightly and again that's just a little bit of gentle retraining so it's not so much propping up on a heap of pillows it's having the whole bed up a little bit classically a phone book <laughs> um, other things that people find really helpful 
is wearing compression gear. And what that does, again, it's a little bit like the muscles in your legs, having something tight around ideally ankle to waist, so calves, thighs, and the waist area, a pair of good sports compression tights can do this, is again, that stops the blood all dropping downwards. And we do know that for a lot of people, they pull a lot of blood around the tummy area, which is why they often feel queasy along with these symptoms. I've got a quite silly picture there, but it's demonstrating some of the maneuvers that you can do actually actively using the muscles in your lower body to help um, lessen symptoms when you become upright or if you're already upright and you're starting to develop symptoms. And so while they've got pictures there of, you know, leg crossing or lifting one leg up and bending over, the ones that I find people seem to find the most helpful is actually pumping your calf muscles. So often just moving from foot to foot, pumping your calf muscles or clenching the muscles in your backside. And I know that sounds weird, but the gluteus maximus is the biggest muscle in the body. And you can often get about 500 mils of blood back up to your head. And so I've got some people who will do that every time they stand up. Or other people who might say, well, you know, if I'm at the supermarket and I'm stand for too long and I can feel it coming on and I don't want to just sit down or put my head between my knees, I can do those things and it helps me to feel better. And a lot of people have sort of subconsciously put some of this into their day-to-day -day life to help manage their symptoms. Um, oh, I did put the resting semi-recumbent on this page as well. And, and some of it also is looking into other things that can make it worse. So we know that if it's really hot, what happens is you vasodilate. What that means is all the blood flow in your body opens up. So your blood volume is distributed throughout your whole body rather than more centrally. And that's why people look red when they're hot because there's more blood flow to the skin. What that effectively means though is less blood going to your brain. So overheating is often, you know, absolute kryptonite to people with OI. It's easier said than done to avoid overheating, but dressing in layers, people often may carry a, um, a drink bottle with ice, ice cubes in it, so they've got something really cool to sip on. People will often learn which particular things may trigger them and learn to manage it. So for some people, it's maybe if they're standing for too long. For other people, it may be if they jump out of bed too quickly in the middle of the night. So everyone's a little bit different, and it's that sort of understanding your own situation and managing that. Some people need equipment. Hot showers are often a real killer because you're standing. It's often the morning when your blood pressure is naturally at its lowest and you don't adapt so quickly. Um, so a stool in the shower can help. Um, but the other thing that can often help for people who really struggle with showering is having a glass of water before showering. And that's got nothing to do with hydration. But there's a reflex where you basically bring your blood pressure up a little bit and allow more blood to go to your brain. So having a glass of water will make that difference, you know, by the time you're getting into your shower. I'll only briefly talk about medications because we are running quite short on time and I want to allow some time for questions. But the evidence behind the medications does really come from the POTS population. There's less evidence for people with MECFS. But the one of these ones that I will sometimes try and someone who's got terrible orthostatic intolerance and who has lowish blood pressures is something called flutocortisone, which basically helps your body to hold on to extra fluid. Um, the other ones, beta blockers and things to tighten up the blood vessels in your body, there's not really a lot of evidence behind using those in MECFS and particularly with beta blockers, they often make things worse because they can lower your blood pressure and can make fatigue worse. People often ask about dietary changes, so I thought I'd mention that briefly, and there isn't a lot of hard evidence. And maybe that's because there's so much individual variation for what works for people. Um, and so I don't tend to be hard and fast about this. I would caution people from ending up in a situation where they've restricted one thing, then another, then another, and suddenly they're hardly eating anything. And I have seen that, and I've seen people get in a really bad way with that. So I think if you're trying some dietary measures, I would do that in a stepwise fashion. So if you are doing one 
and it's really not doing anything for you, then I would reintroduce that food. And I mean, that's obviously better done through a dietitian who can monitor, help you monitor it. But of course, not everyone can find a dietitian or afford to see one. Um, there is a little bit of evidence behind a low carb diet because there's a thought that particularly high sugars can lead to sort of, you know, sugar rush and then crash that can make all of this worse. And if someone is low on vitamin D, that may make a difference. A lot of people will find caffeine and alcohol worsen their symptoms. Um, and there's been so much interest in probiotics and in the gut microbiome. And it was a little bit disappointing, I guess, really, that a recent study showed no real difference in the microbiome between people with POTS and people without. So while some people might try probiotics, especially if they've got a lot of digestive symptoms, if it works for you, I think that's great. If it doesn't, then there will be no reason to continue. Likewise, a low histamine diet, um, histamine can produce flushing, tachycardia, etc. Um, heavily controversial. Some people do notice a difference. And my gut feeling is that if you are someone who struggles a lot with hay fever or hives um, or asthma, and you notice that you get a lot of flushing and you notice that you're better on a low histamine diet, then by all means do that. But it's not a it's not a you know, one size fits all. If we look at the prognosis for people with POTS, um, again, I'll go through this only briefly, but it has a huge impact on quality of life. And originally when people were studying this condition, they thought that most people made a full recovery. And now what they're understanding is the people who make a full recovery, and that is quite a lot, about a third at one year, that more tends to be the post-viral ones in young people. So it may be a sort of temporary sort of thing, but there are many people who live with POTS long-term. If you look at the big groups, um, most of them though can get improvement. There are very few people who will go on to progressively deteriorate and there's no signs that it um, shortens your lifespan, although it clearly has a huge effect on day-to-day -day life. I believe that's the end of all my main slides. There's a few other things to talk about, and this is just a bit of a silly slide, but um, I used to go to the American Autonomic Conference every year back in the day. And here on the far right is my colleague, David Jardine, who I wanted to mention as having been my mentor who trained me up in all this many years ago. And on the far left is Dr. Satish Raj, um, and next to him, Dr. Julian Stewart, who are in Canada and New York, respectively, and they have been leading lights in terms of um, investigating orthostatic intolerance um, in both POTS and ME. So just wanted to mention them, really. And it looks like they're doing a counter manoeuvre um, to try and improve their blood volumes. <laughs> I'll stop there because there may well be questions. I can see there's some things in the chat thread. But maybe I can't easily view that thread unless I undo, undo my screen sharing. Oh yeah, that's just where we were up to. So perhaps if anyone does want to either ask me some questions or submit via the chat thread, I'm more than happy to, um, to answer as best I can. Um, in the symptoms one, um, well, it might not have been a symptom slide. One of the slides was talking about um, cognitive difficulties when standing or as a, yeah. as a symptom. Would that mean that um, when, <laughs> when we are out and about and we're struggling to think, like can't think of the word, things like that, that sitting down might help? Yeah, there have been some situations where they've done some testing and it's worse when people are upright and better when they're sitting down. And so, yeah. Absolutely. And what's not clear or squeezing is, you know, our butt, as you were you were saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you do a little bit of a counter maneuver, will that make a difference to what yeah. problem you want to think about or work through? But yeah, definitely it does seem that that people will think more clearly when they yeah, when they're sitting than when they're standing. That could be a, just a useful trick for just coping out in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, my other comment was the, the CO2 saturation thing. 
there has been research that says that in the MECFS, um, our cells don't take up the oxygen from our blood properly. Um, and they do see that not enough carbon dioxide coming back to the, the lungs. It's fascinating, yes. isn't it? And there's so much that um, we don't know what's caused and what's effect. Um, and the CO2 thing, I didn't really go into it in terms of hyperventilation because I don't think that's a cause on its own. And it looks like the research is sort of backing that up. But once in a blue moon, I will meet someone where hyperventilation is contributing to how they feel and making it worse, which makes sense because if you are hyperventilating for whatever reason, be it, um, be it asthma, be it chest wall injury, be it that you're running into problems with anxiety or panic disorder and you're breathing using these little muscles in your chest, not breathing efficiently, breathing out more carbon dioxide, that is going to constrict those blood vessels to your brain and make all your other symptoms worse. So definitely, I in our, quite case, in our case, if our mitochondria aren't using the oxygen, it's, it's not leaving the blood, so there's nowhere for the CO2 to go. So we end up with, we end up with excess lactic acid in our cells because we have too much CO2 left swimming around our cells. And then we, and we don't, because we're not breathing it out. Yeah, that metabolism side of things is yeah. not working as it should. So, and I didn't sort of delve into the, um, the mitochondrial side of things, but obviously there's a lot of work going on with that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's incredibly intriguing, not yet at a level of, here's all the answers. Yeah, or anything useful yet, but. <laughs> and so certainly, uh, as far as the low CO2 goes, there is the odd person, if I think they've developed hyperventilation on top of it, that can benefit some, from some breathing retraining, but that's probably less than less than half of the people that I would meet with orthostatic intolerance. So it's definitely not an across the board thing. I absolutely agree with you there. There's other stuff going on. Dr. Butler, any Sorry. comments any any comments about uh, vagus nerve stimulation to try and <laughs> quieten the fight and fight or fight or freeze, the parasympathetic, try and calm it down. Yeah, it's quite exciting and there's a lot, um, there was a huge buzz about this, um, I want to say about four or five years ago in one of the autonomic conferences I went to, focused quite a bit on that mm. and it seemed, I'm still watching the space because it seems very appealing mm. and I know that there are some people who have had them in for various reasons um, and they've been you know, there's been a lot of case studies of individual people who have had a lot of benefit from it. And when you try and analyze it in a bigger group to say, is there definitely a benefit and how much is it and who would benefit from most, there's not any hard evidence in there yet. But there is, um, it's still an area to me of great interest. It's not something that we can put into practice here as yet because we haven't got any definitive proven benefit from it. And so far as I know, I mean, often one way to get things that aren't quite yet definitely proven in New Zealand is a clinical trial. But so far as I'm aware, there aren't any clinical trials of that going on in New Zealand at the moment. Um, around that same time, there was a whole heap of interest in the link between the vagus, sort of in this line, the link between the vagus nerve, the immune system and the gut um, mm what they make the gut brain, the, the nervous system in the gut, and some really exciting stuff coming out, confirming that link, and there was cases of people who'd had a vagus nerve stimulator put in, and it had cured their inflammatory bowel disease or their rheumatoid arthritis. It was yeah. extremely exciting, and I think it still is. It just hasn't moved at the pace, I guess, that we all sort of hoped in terms of, you know, proving proving the benefits, yeah. And it is a bit of a, um, it's quite a crucial area to be sticking things into. So I guess you want to know that it's most likely to help your, per, your you know, your person and not harm them. So, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of folk using the tragus, ear, ear tragus with uh, TENS machines. There's quite a following. Yeah, there is. And I have met some people in America doing that. Mm. And... Um, 
sort of spoken to a, a patient who found it incredibly helpful. And so there's a bit of that. There are people doing sort of acupuncture, acupressure to that area. And there are people also trying to alter that process, the vagal stimulation, using things like meditation um, and mindfulness. Um, and, you know, I think I always have to be a bit careful if I'm talking about that sort of stuff with people that they don't think that I'm suggesting they just need to chill out and it will fix everything that's wrong with them because clearly it won't. But there is, you know, a bit of evidence that you can alter your autonomic, that balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic by things like meditation and yoga. Now, I think yoga would be probably out of the question for um, most people with MACFS because it's physically quite draining but you know certainly the meditation side of things some people can find helpful other people get, get nothing from it there's no harm in trying it because it may make a difference even like the breathing even yeah. the breathing the parasympathetic uh, diaphragmic breathing is very beneficial for some absolutely yeah absolutely um just any of those things that may shift the balance more towards the parasympathetic vagus type stimulation. Thank you, Dr. Butler. There was a bit of interest as well in fish oil for that sort of same mm. reason of mm. perhaps affecting that gut immune vagus axis. Again, there was a real flurry of excitement about that and, and, and everything seems to have slowed a little bit, which is frustrating. And I don't know whether that's because people haven't been able to complete the studies or it's just not been borne out or what's going on, but I'm watching the space. And again, I think there's no harm in people trying something like fish oil, but all these things are, are kind of hard on the wallet, probiotics, fish oil, <laughs> they're hard on the wallet. And so what I'll often say is, you know, you can give things a good go. And by a good go, you want to know, you want to give it at least six weeks, ideally a bit longer. And if you find after you know, six to eight weeks, it's no difference at all. It's probably not going to make a big difference. And then one of the other things I'll often say to people is if you're looking to try various different options that are unlikely to cause harm and may give you some benefit, don't try them all at once. So don't, you know, don't start fish oil, probiotics, low histamine, dairy-free, gluten-free. You, you won't know which thing's helping. And it also so many changes all at once could potentially, you know, knock your system around. Wonderful, wonderful. It's challenging. I, I wish I could have come along and, I mean, but you guys know better than me. There's no quick fix and no easy answer, but um, yeah, there are, there are things that may help some people and not others. And I really hope that over time we'll get a clearer indication of why some things might help some people and not others. You know, what are these different groups that people fall into with orthostatic intolerance, be it POTS, be it MACFS with orthostatic intolerance, which people are more, you know, mitochondrial, which people might be more, you know, vagus nerve, which people might be immune or genetic and how we can target, you know, management of your symptoms to specific individuals rather than sort of, okay, here's what works for a lot of people, you know, works for it and see what works best for you. Any final question? I think we've, yeah, um, well, maybe we'll wrap it up there, um, Dr. Butler. And I'm, we're just so grateful for you to have um, come and, and sh shared your expert knowledge with us. Um, it's we've, I've learned a lot, and you know you've given us some tools, and and also um, you know just acknowledged uh, how little or is known, or how much there still is to know. That's really great for us um, to to have you know have that understood yeah um and we just hope that the journey for finding answers um you know keeps going and, and perhaps increases in pace but yeah um it is not, i mean it's not good that there are people with long covid it's it's dreadful mm, mm. the only silver lining is that it may lead on to more understanding that's generalizable yeah a lot of other yeah 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 
So yeah, I do want to thank you all for having me and also for your patience with the total failure of system the first time and the difficulties this time around. At least the network held up for sort of the second half of it. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah that's great. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay. Thank, Bye. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.